This lecture is titled Preaching God's Fiesta, a homiletic of resistance, empowerment, and celebration. I really had very little to live for in the summer of 75. My mom died that summer on June 11th, and I was 14 years old. She was only 38. My mother's death forced me to enter into a relationship with my strange father. And uh, although I had been born in New York, I had grown up in Puerto Rico, and my dad, uh, in many ways escaping the situation because he was not happy about having father a child out of wedlock, he moved to the U.S. Virgin Islands, specifically to St. Thomas and then from St. Thomas to, to St. Croix. So uh, I had to fly to St. Croix to spend some time with him to see if I could live with him or not. I got acquainted then with him, with uh, his wife, and with my three uh, brothers. And after a couple of days in Christiansted, which were very difficult days, my dad told me that we were going on vacation to a place called St. John, another one of the U.S. Virgin Islands. And uh, we got into an army surplus plane, an old Grunman G-21, an amphibian plane called affectionately the Goose. And we went from Christiansted in St. Croix to Charlotte de Mali in St. Thomas. And from St. Thomas, uh, from, from that city, we got a, on a bus. We went to a pier. We got into, on a ferry. And finally, we got to St. John. I had grown up in the Caribbean. I had seen Puerto Rico, which is beautiful, but I had never seen an island as beautiful as St. John. It was something else. St. John, most of it is a national park. So... Uh, most of the, of the island was not populated. You had all these beautiful ecosystems like a tropical forest, but then you had the beach at the same time in the same city. And uh, trails so you could walk from one place to another. And it was just amazing. The only hotel at the time, I understand that there's another one now, but the only hotel at the time was Canil Bay, one of the most expensive hotels in the Caribbean. Now, of course, we could not stay there, so we camped in tents among the wababeri bushes. Then uh, the 4th of July came. And again, I didn't speak any English. I understood a bit. I had never lived any significant amount of time in the States. And so for me, the 4th of July was just a day off. I was a foreigner among my own people in many ways. So I was there bored to tears. And then it happened. Uh, my dad uh, asked me to walk to the pier in uh, Cruz Bay, which is the, the only city in St. John. And uh, the ferry came with the governor and the lieutenant governor. And uh, uh, an army drill team uh, marching. And then my dad said, prepare to be amazed. I didn't understand what I was supposed to be amazed by. But then it happened. Jepson and his Calypso band came off the ferry on a truck playing Calypso. And uh, the music was just incredible. You don't know that I'm a... a a percussionist. I'm a trained percussionist. I play all kinds of drums. And uh, the beat from the English-speaking Caribbean just got into my bones. And on, although I didn't understand a single word of whatever they were saying, songs like Yellow Bird just burned in my soul. And after the first Calypso bands came down, people came and began to walk after the trucks. Well, not walk, to dance after the trucks. There was even a, a Boy Scout drill team that they said that they were marching, but actually they were just dancing Calypso too. So everybody was dancing, everybody was dancing. And uh, you see this mass of people, white and brown and black, all of them dancing. And then uh, the Makajambis came. Those are the people who dance on stilts. 
and they were dancing and sometimes when they got tired they would just, they would just lean against a lamppost. And all of a sudden I see this picture of food, music, laughter, joy, merriment and hope. I'd never seen such a thing and here I was feeling guilty because less than 30 days after the death of my mom I was feeling joyful. And for a long time, I thought that I would never feel joyful again. Those images haunted me. Those images haunted me of that fiesta, of that carnival, of that parade. And uh, as I returned to Puerto Rico, where I decided to stay with relatives instead of living with my dad, uh, life was very tough. And on the Holy Week of 1976, I attended a worship service at a disciple's church, Sierra Linda. And uh, I came to faith on Palm Sunday. And I felt joyful again. I felt joyful again. I began to learn about Jesus. I began to, to learn about God's love. I began to read the Bible. And in the Bible, I found it. I found the parade. I found the fiesta. It's in Revelation 7. There it was. People from every tribe and nation. Dancing and singing. In heaven. Then I realized that God's kingdom. It's a fiesta. And I am sure that there's some calypso beat. <laughs> up there. You know. My dad then came to faith too. He was a nominal Catholic, but he became part of the charismatic movement. And he attended this wonderful church called the Baron Spot uh, Catholic Church. And uh, that was an amazing congregation. It was multicultural. So you had people from the English-speaking Caribbean, from the French-speaking Caribbean, from the Spanish-speaking Caribbean, from the Dutch-speaking Caribbean. You had white people and mixed people and black people all together. Some European people from America. You had uh, a priest who had po Polish roots, but even though he was an American, he fully acculturated to that church. And worshiping at Baron Spot was amazing. You had over 500 people all singing, Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. It was amazing. I still remember the day where the priest said, I'm going to teach you now a new song, but only if you dance it. If you don't dance it, I will not teach it. Of course, everything in the Mass was play to a calypso or soca beat. A soca is a mixture of calypso and rock. <coughs> the priest knew me. And he knew that I was a candidate to the ministry on a Protestant church. It didn't matter. He invited me over. He asked me to talk, to preach, to testify at prayer meetings. <coughs> and they shared the bountiful mercies of God with me. Even though I was different. Totally different from them. The lessons learned at Barrett Spot didn't stop there. Because about a year later, I got to St. Croix on Pentecost Day. I had preached in my local church. And I had gone to the airport, getting the short hop to the island. And I was there about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And my dad said, there's a party I want you to go to. And I said, party? How do you dare to talk about parties? Today's Pentecost Day. It's a high holy day. And, I, and he said, don't worry. Just come with me. And there was this beautiful service at a place that would hold about 3,000 people, and it was almost full. There were 12 ministers in, at the podium, four Catholic priests, and the other were Protestant ministers, Baptists, Moravian, and Assemblies of God. The service began, and the part of confession of sin took about an hour, because every minister and priest stood up there and ask for God's forgiveness 
because they have been dividing the church and demonizing the other Christians. It was amazing. That day I said, I'm seeing a sliver of God's kingdom right here on earth. These seminal experiences have largely shaped my faith, my life, and my ministry. I am thoroughly convinced that God has called the church to be a true manifestation of God's kingdom here on earth. And I am also thoroughly convinced that God's kingdom is, by definition, multilingual and multicultural, including people from every tribe and nation, because God's kingdom is indeed God's fiesta. Sadly, when I moved to the States to pursue my second master's, I realized that the church in the States was largely divided along racial lines. It was segregated by race, by race ethnicity, and language. And uh, in 85, when I moved to Indiana, um, I went to a seminary, a very good seminary, where I had good professors, some of whom have been mentors and friends to this day. But I was the only Latino in the school. Well, you don't understand. Not even in the cleaning crew, there was a Latino. None on staff, none on faculty, none on other student. I was the only one there. Church-wise, I had to choose between the closest disciple churches, the ones that I could walk to. Uh, one was an African-American church, and the other one was a white church. There were no Latino churches in Indiana of my denomination at the time. Now we have two, very small, but at least you have some options. Well. In any case, I chose to join the African American congregation. Although sometimes I attended one of the local Anglo European churches. But in spite of the warm reception that I received in every congregation that I attended, it was clear to me that I was the other, mm -hmm. that I was different. Later on, as I developed my career as a pastor and a would-be theologian, I identified with this new movement that we call Hispanic Latino Latina theology, which at the time was kind of a fledging movement of people who wanted to think the faith from our point of view of being Latinos in this country. In particularly, in particular, I have dedicated most of my academic life to the study of homiletics from a Latino-Latina perspective. And today, I am more convinced than ever that Hispanic theology has a contribution to make, not only to the life of Latinos and Latinas in the States, but to the larger church in the United States and in the world. I am convinced that the aim of Hispanic homiletics should be to show the world how to preach God's holy fiesta, even in the midst of a broken world. Given that Hispanics in the United States have been permanently the other, Latino-Latina homiletics can serve as a model for those willing to engage otherness and exclusion in a postmodern world. In particular, I believe that Latino-Latina homiletics character is characterized by, by a three-part hermeneutical model, which moved from survival to empowerment to celebration. So let's begin with survival. Hispanic theology, as all contextual theologies, has a clear point of departure, which is reality. Contextual theologies depart from a consideration of the current social, political, and financial situation of people. That is the point of departure. It's an analysis of how you're living, what is your situation in life. In order to develop a theology that may have a positive impact in the people, on the people we serve, first, we must understand the situation that we want to transform. The Latino-Latin experience in the United States is characterized by suffering. 
It's inescapable when you see our history. Hispanics have lived in the States from the very beginning. Even before the United States was the United States, there were Latinos. There were Hispanics in what we now call the United States, in North America. And uh, the Latino-Latina community has experienced tremendous growth in the last decades due to a younger median age, a higher birth rate, but also an influx of immigrants who have come from Latin America and the Caribbean. Suffering is a constant, both for those born in the States and for those recently arrived. From the descendants of the first Spanish immigrants to those Mexicans whose lands were taken away in the 19th century, to Puerto Ricans who became citizens after the Spanish-American War, Hispanics know suffering. From those who were deported to Mexico during the World War II, even though they were born in the States, to those who furtively crossed the border or overstayed a visa to pursue a dream here in the States, Hispanics know suffering. Latinos and Latinas form a complex set of subcultures. Not a single culture, but a complex set of subcultures in the United States. And those cultures are united and divided by a common language, which is Spanish. However, all Hispanics, it doesn't matter their national background, migratory status, skin color, academic achievement, or personal wealth, all of us have experienced the effects of racism, discrimination, and bigotry in one way or another. In many ways, such suffering is a direct result of colonialism. Colonialism is a distinct form of imperialism. It's a racist ideology that sustain oppressive practices. And those oppressive practices are based on the premise that the colonizer is inherently superior to the colonized. Colonialism locks both the colonizer and the colonized into a rigid hierarchy of difference. A hierarchy that defines both masters and slaves. To say it bluntly, the colonizer cannot feel superior if he doesn't have a colonized person that he can deem as inferior. And I use gender-specific language because colon colonial ideology is patriarchal. It follows a binary logic by which the colonizer defined himself as everything that the colonized is not. The colonizer is white. The colonized is colored. The colonizer is civilized. The colonized are barbaric. The colonizer is cultured, but the colonized are savages. Colonialism also operates on the basis of an ideology of race. And that ideology supports a superstructure, an ideological superstructure that creates racist categories to classify other people, assigning negative essential traits to the wide array of non-white peoples. But then you have to add gender as a corollary so that women of color are not only considered essentially inferior, but also morally corrupt. At the same time, Anglo-European women became invisible by a racist, patriarchal discourse that didn't even acknowledge their existence. Today, thankfully, traditional colonialism is largely dead. It survived in many ways, but straight old 19th century colonialism is largely dead. 
We have entered into a new phase in the world, a post-colonial phase, where those of us who descend from the former colonized peoples are now living in the so-called first world. One political uh, analyst in Puerto Rico wrote a book called Invading the Invader. And that's what's happening. It's happening in France. It's happening in Britain. It's happening even in Germany, although they are struggling against it. (laughs) And it's happening in the States. And that explains why we have a biracial man as president of the United States. That is a clearly post-colonial trait that could not have happened decades ago. The post-colonial condition also forces ethnic theologians to develop post-colonial patterns of thought. And those insights must deconstruct many of the ideas that we receive, even theological ideas that we received and that were ingrained into our churches and our theology largely through missionary endeavors. We need to deconstruct those ideas because if we don't deconstruct those ideas, it will be impossible to build the new understandings needed to undergird the construction of a new identity for our people. The affirmation of cultural identity is one of the characteristics of this postmodern and postcolonial times. Latinos and Latinas in the United States are trying to construct a new identity. And this is tricky because, again, you have people from different countries. Like in the case of my own family, one of my brothers, he is a Puerto Rican born in St. Croix, and he's married to a Peruvian woman who grew up in Georgia, in Atlanta, Georgia. And then they lived in Puerto Rico for three years, and they lived in Mexico for four years. So my my, my little uh, nephew feels Mexican because, you know, he, he was two years old when he went to Mexico. And We can no longer be Puerto Rican or Peruvian or Mexican. We're Latinos, Latinas in the States. We are constructing a new thing that had never taken place before. The Christian faith has been a key element in the development of a theology of survival for our people. It has enthused people to hope, even against all hope, for a better tomorrow. Jesus Christ is not only a personal savior, as is seen in in traditional evangelicalism, but it's also a fellow brown-skinned immigrant, part of our community, the one who knows firsthand what is it to be oppressed, what is it to be a member of an ethnic group in a metropolis, one who was finally murdered by a foreign occupation army. Jesus ultimately teaches us a lesson, the ultimate lesson, embodying the redemptive power of suffering. The Galilean teacher becomes the paradigm of survival for Latinos and Latinas in the United States. Hispanic theology calls this the Galilean principle. It was developed originally by Virgilio Elizondo and his many disciples. Elizondo is a Catholic theologian. But also has become part of, of, our, of, of all Latino theology, Pentecostal theology, and even Protestant theology. Elizondo defines the Catholic principle as follows. First principle for the New Testament interpretation of, of the contemporary situation is the Galilean principle. What human beings reject, God chooses for his very own. For Mexican-American Christians, it is in the life and the gift of faith that they discover their ultimate identity as God's chosen people. It is in the cultural identity of Jesus the Galilean that the ultimate meaning of their cultural identity becomes clear. This mestizaje, the miscegenation, 
is their Galilean identity and challenge. The world's rejection of Mestizaje is not unrelated to God's choice of it. What the world rejects, God chooses. To advance the historical working out of the eschaton, the final age, one step further, with each new Mestizaje, some cultural frontiers that divide humanity are raised, and the new unity is formed. Interestingly, even preachers with no formal training gravitate to these images of Jesus. Preaching about the miracles, preaching about Jesus as a fellow Latino, a fellow brown-skinned person. Even in the Hebrew Bible, when we go there, we find texts that help us to survive, like the Psalms of Lament, the narratives of liberation, and the prophecies of hope. However, even if the first stage is survival, there's a second stage, and the second stage is empowerment. Our life is not only suffering, our faith is not only there to soothe our suffering, the second component of our hermeneutical process is empowerment. Because through faith, hope, and endurance, the Latino-Latina community in the United States has developed strategies. Strategies to face, to struggle against, and finally, to triumph over adversity, discrimination, and hate. Once again, the Christian faith has been a source of hope. A source of hope for the Hispanic community. Pneumatology in particular, in particular is very important. The doctrine of the Holy Spirit teaches us that God empowers all believers, equipping believers with charismatic gifts and spiritual fruits that enable them to persevere in la lucha, to, to keep on struggling for life. Early holiness and Pentecostal movements with their theological emphasis on God's power, they have had a crucial impact in the Hispanic community. The emphasis on the power of the Holy Spirit is universally present in Latino-Latina theology, even in Catholic and mainline Protestant quarters. Therefore, seeking the fullness of the Holy Spirit, particularly through an experience of personal sanctification, such as the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's usually seen as a turning point in the life of a believer in the Latino-Latina community. Now, why is that important? It is important because preaching that calls the congregation to seek the spiritual gifts empowers the community, empowers the Christian community to dream with a, about a better future, hoping for a radical transformation. These theological emphases teach Hispanic youth that they can overcome. They can overcome poverty and triumph over substance abuse and renounce violence and improve the quality of their lives and achieve goals that seemed impossible yes. to their parents. The Holy Spirit gives the gift of prophecy to the community. Now this is crucial for us. Because this empowerment, in order to speak the word of God, comes from the Holy Spirit. And why is this so important? This is crucial because colonialism, colonialism told us that we could not speak. Colonialism undermines the identity of the colonized. It shapes your self-image, teaching you that there is a place for you. And that you should know your place. The colonized were acculturated to see Anglo-European hegemony as logical, as natural, and even divinely, di di divinely <coughs> foreordained. And this situation inevitably leads to a confrontation between the emerging Latino-Latina identity and the colonial discourse that we learned in school. That colonial discourse legitimized Anglo-European hegemony. Not only over Hispanics in the United States, but also over Latin America and the Caribbean. 
It is impossible to construct a theology with, from, and for the Hispanic, Latino, Latina people without addressing the way in which the colonial discord shaped our identity as colonial subalterns. If indeed we Hispanics have been acculturated to think ill about ourselves, to think that we cannot make it, if the socialization system, mainly the school system, had taught, has taught us in myriad ways that this is not our country, that we made no contribution to our history, that all of us have recently arrived, how can you find a voice to speak against an oppressive system? If indeed we have internalized our positions as social and economic subalterns, how can the subaltern speak? Here I am dialogue with Chakraborty Gayatri Spivak, uh, an Indian post-colonial thinker who taught at Emory for a while. And uh, she wrote an article precisely titled, can the subaltern speak? And there are three options. The first one is that no, it's impossible for, for the subaltern to speak. Every time that, you, that, that the colonized speak, the only thing that they do is that they regurgitate the same things that they have learned. It's impossible to escape their identity as colonized. Another option is that, well, most subalterns cannot speak, but there is an elite. So there's an elite of colonized people who go to the better universities and get educated. So you have a small elite speaking for the unlearned masses. That's another option that some people advocate. And in many ways, this is international politics, where you see that the president of a Latin American country is a graduate from one of the best universities in the States. But there's a third option. Third option affirms that subaltern groups always kept a voice. The voice was hidden. The voice was uh, subversive. But they always had a voice. They kept that voice going through cultural practices, through different texts, understanding texts in the larger context, that empowered them to face and ultimately deconstruct the false identity thrusted upon them by colonial rule. This means that the subaltern has always been able to speak, always, and that he or she has been constantly speaking even though the colonial powers didn't understand their discourse, even though the colonial rulers disregarded this important voice or even actively tried to suppress it. We have always had a voice. As a student of homiletics, then I, has, I have to ask, is it worth it? to teach homiletics to Hispanics? Can the subaltern preach? In other words, can the Hispanic community deconstruct the false identities fostered by the colonial theologies that define us as subaltern? Can the Latino people develop counter-hegemonic religious practices and text? Can we find a voice to preach a contextualized gospel that reads the Bible from the tradition and the tradition from our social location? And my response is a resounding yes. Yes, we can. Yes, we can preach. Why we can preach? Because we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit empowers the church precisely to speak, giving people the prophetic voice. However, in order to preach the liberated message of the gospel in a relevant fashion, the Hispanic community has to deconstruct the, post, the, the colonial homiletic and construct a post-colonial homiletic.
Such homiletic theory, informed by Hispanic theology and hermeneutics, will denounce and unmask the colonial ideologies that undermine a people for so long. Such post-colonial homiletic must also build upon the interests of Latinos and Latinas in eschatology. Why? Because even in our poorest communities, Hispanic preaching tends to emphasize the doctrine of the second coming of Jesus, stressing the urgency that such an eschatological event is going to produce in each believer, because that is a way of saying, this is not the ultimate reality. There's something else. There is something else. The impact of this emphasis on Jesus' impending return among Latinos cannot be underestimated. Among its many effects, it stresses that God will judge all people, even the colonizers. Finally, granting a divine justice that our current political system cannot deliver. It also lifts the congregation above poverty, because what do we sing about? We sing about the New Jerusalem. And in the New Jerusalem, aren't the streets made out of gold? Apocalyptic preaching celebrates the upcoming great reversal, which will usher times of peace, justice, and love. Therefore, a post-colonial homiletic must build upon the prophetic imagination exemplified both by the ancient prophets and the early church. Walter Brueggemann, to borrow a phrase of him, spoke of prophetic preaching as a testimony to otherwise. So Latino-Latina preaching is a testimony to otherwise, saying that the current oppressive system does not have the last word. The subject of empowerment also leads us to consider, to, to consider Latina theology the reflection done by Hispanic women. Why? Because women suffer due to the systemic oppression. And what we need is a liberation, both to the oppressor and to the oppressed. Therefore, no true empowerment can occur without seeking the full inclusion of women as partners in the struggle for liberation. Now the third movement, the third component, is celebration. Some people ask why Hispanic worship services are so rich, so long, and so loud. And the answer is simple. We celebrate in life. Even in the midst of poverty, we celebrate in life. And we're celebrating a life that has not been granted by the colonial powers, but by God. We celebrate that God has granted us in Jesus the power of the Holy Spirit. And even if they kill us, there's resurrection. Yes. Most Hispanic congregations are integral to the communities. Maybe you don't understand this. Our churches are not only located close to the schools and the convenience stores and the soccer field, they're also close to the bars and the pawn shops where our grandsons sell the things that they have stolen from us but also to the drug open markets where the drug dealers sell their poison. It is common when you're in a Latino church in the States, from your pew to hear gunshots, police chatter, and ambulance sirens. In that context, Hispanic worship services are joyful. Because we are celebrating God's tender mercies. In response to divine love, Latinos and Latinas thank God. We celebrate that we have survived. We celebrate that God has empowered us and that God is with us. We celebrate the glorious future promise to the faithful. And the celebration does not end with a closing prayer. This is a, this is a celebration that goes with us to our homes, to our schools our places of work. Latino preaching thus emphasizes God's promises for the believer. It also celebrates how God responds to our prayers providing sustenance even though we are poor. And this is this this explains why. A common form in our pulpits is what we call testimonios, where people will just come and witness about how God has responded to his 
or her prayer. Survival, empowerment, and hope. Three crucial elements that together constitute a redemptive movement toward God. The unchurched and the new believers who start their journey of faith find this unspoken movement in our preaching, teaching, and worship. The person who arrives in utter despair is ushered into this movement, which seeks to help the, every person face his or her situation, receive the necessary tools to address it, and find joy in the process for struggling for life. Of course, Hispanics are not the only ones who preach this matter. Basically, every person from a persecuted or oppressed group will identify with this movement from survival to empowerment to celebration. This movement is present whenever the poor, the marginalized and the excluded gather to worship. And precisely for this reason, this movement can help us to build bridges of communication, fellowship, and to work jointly with other communities. This movement can also serve as a model for pastoral action. Our outreach ministries can also follow this pattern, helping people to survive, empowering them to achieve a better life, and celebrating with them God's bountiful mercies. Let us thus strive to preach God's divine fiesta, leading God's people from suffering to empowerment to celebration.